translate for them and talk with them. And the relief on their face comes in when you walk in and they're like, they're just you entiendes, si 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 entiendo, entiendo bien, pero solo hablo poquito. And everybody, the, the smile that they feel to feel seen. And that is where my Spanish now is geared towards making my patients feel understood, making sure that they they have their meals ordered because even that something that we take for granted as saying, you know, oh, oh just call down, they're gonna get you orders. These people who speak solely Spanish cannot, you know, translate that. So if they don't have somebody who's willing to take the time to help them, then they either don't eat or they bring food from home. So that's a big part of where my Spanish now I'm really trying to be dedicated to um, learn more and talk more and those kind of sort of things to be able to translate for my patients. So that's what I feel now in recent years, maybe about three years ago, that I uh, really tried to learn more Spanish. Um, and I think that's where my experience mainly lies, is the experience in the hospitals and, and why it's so important to be able to speak with patients and like I said, the relief that they have is just a big time thing. Um, and no longer being afraid of speaking the wrong Spanish. Being told that you're speaking a different language or being told that your dialect of Spanish is incorrect. And learning to unlearn that, essentially, um, was a really big thing and has now increased a lot of my confidence with speaking Spanish. Um, and then see if you could speak. What my other questions were. Um, so I guess in general, one of our questions was, uh, you know, how influences your identity? And language is always a big central part of a lot of that. So when we're, you know, back then when people weren't allowed to speak Spanish, when they were being told, you know, uh, getting in trouble for speaking Spanish or those sorts of things, we started losing our language then. Now we're starting to lose our language again because people didn't pass it on in fear that their kids would go through the same thing, that they would be discriminated or again, being told that their Spanish is wrong. Um, Spanish, or just language in general, is truly the backbone of any culture. And if we don't have language, then we don't have culture. And so I think um, going forward, obviously, I mean, trying to promote the language and those sorts of things is very important. So, yeah, that's my story. Thank you. Everybody. Um, my name is Paloma Blanca Cura, and I am a senior student here on campus. I'm pursuing my degree in education. Um, I want to start off by thanking everybody that is putting on this event today. Um, this is an event that is a great resource for everybody that came, the CAF, for doing all of the food, all of the people behind the scenes. These are all big things that contribute to a huge cause and the future of this university. Um, I come from a family of public service workers, of people that want to make a difference in other people's lives, especially people that look like us. Um, I was raised in Pueblo. I went to South High School. I played sports. I was involved in a lot of different clubs. I really was able to make the most out of being a part of the community here. And from my own family, like we have talked about, the language sometimes does get lost generationally because of discrimination. And I know for my family that my grandparents spoke Spanish, but they didn't carry that on because they knew that their kids would be discriminated anyway for how we look. And the stereotype that if you know how to speak it would be another weakness. That was something that, like you had said, it's, it's something that you have to unlearn. And I feel like being a part of this community, you really get to a point where it is a part of you. All of this is a part of you. I didn't grow up speaking Spanish, but it was all around me. My family spoke Spanish. We all had the terms of endearments. We were traviesos and we were chions but we were also Hitha and Hitho, and we were, you felt it. There's something that is very, very strong about 
not speaking the language, but feeling that connection in your blood, you carry that with you. So that was something that I have just always carried. I didn't speak it, but I never felt like I was disconnected from my culture. I never felt like I wasn't Mexican, that I wasn't Mexican enough, or that I lacked in different ways. My family practiced so many traditions and so many customs that we were able to keep our culture alive. We watch all the Mexican fights every May and every September. We sing Las Mañanitas for every single birthday. Does not matter what restaurant we're at, we're singing it, and everybody's looking at us. But you know, like those are the things that make that make this culture so rich that you are able to carry these things, that I am able to sit up here and to talk with all of you, that this is an opportunity for everybody here to be able to listen and learn. And there, like I said, there's something so, so powerful about that. And that is my, that is my relationship and my experience with Spanish, is that you all, with all of your stories, have been able to inspire me and impact me without even knowing any of you, that is something that we all are able to share. And on top of that, I just know that in my position, and I'm sure all of you know just how much of an advocate we can be for students. And that was one thing that I was really raised on, that there was a language of integrity, of working hard, of being a public servant, of being able to serve this community and people that look like us, that Spanish did not have to be the language to communicate love and the blood that we have and that we all share. And that is something that has impacted me and that's just something that I want to carry, you know, for my profession. And this is just another part of who I am. And so it is, I am so blessed to be able to sit here at this conference that my grandparents, that my parents, all of the hard work that they have put in to Title I schools, to low-income families, to this whole entire community, that this is all able to give, to give back. It's a full circle moment. And this being an HSI, we have such a great opportunity to be a resource and an outreach to the rest of this community, to be able to give these kids resources, to be able to show that there are people that are there for you, that there are people that want to be advocates for you, that there are people that believe in you. And I feel like that is also something that is a part of our culture, a part of our heritage, is taking care of each other. So I think that this is just a really great segue into a whole entire new era of education, of higher education. I have generations that have graduated from here. My grandma graduated from here. My parents graduated from here. I'm gonna graduate from here. My dad was a Spanish-speaking student when he started in elementary school. And he was attending here when it was the uh, University of Southern Colorado. And he was telling us that there were not resources like the ones that we have now. There were not outreach programs like the ones that we have now. He was telling us that he would have to write papers You'd have to go into the library and physically take a dictionary and look up words and how they would fit in papers. He was having to be an advocate for himself. And now we have a room full of people that want to be advocates, that want to be a resource, that want to help change people's lives. So my experience with Spanish is that I, I don't speak it. It's all around me. It's a part of me. It's a part of my culture. I'm able to share all of this. And that is something that transfers to any language, any language, any heritage, any age, that we are all part of something so big for a huge community. So I'm really thankful to be here. I appreciate all of you and hearing all the stories and being able to really take all of this in. It's a learning experience for everybody. I'm really lucky to be up here, but I'm also really lucky to have to see just a room full of people that want to make a change in this university, in this community, that that is something that is so powerful. And we all look alike. A lot of us look alike in this room. We all share something, you know, like we all have this opportunity here and I'm just really, really excited to see where we go from here. And thank you, thank you everybody. That's all I have.
Um, hi everyone, my name is Alondra Daniela Solis Ayala. And so a little bit about me, um, I am sitting here at CSU Pueblo. Uh, I am in my fourth year in the social work department as well as in my fourth year in the Spanish department. And I will have a major in Chicano studies. So I am originally from Gomez Palacio, Durango, Mexico. Um, my family and I lived in Mexico up until I was one years old. And um, once I turned one, my father made the big decision of bringing my family to the United States in hopes of a better life. Um, not just for them, but also for their children and for future generations. So in around December is when my family came to the United States. And we moved to a small little town that's in between Avondale, Colorado, and Boone, Colorado. And I lived there for about 14 years. So growing up, um, Spanish was my first language. Uh, it was my dominant language. It's something that I spoke with my parents. I started to learn English when my parents decided me to put me in a Head Start school because they knew the power that language had in the United States. They knew that I would have better opportunities if I grew up bilingual. And so ever since I was about the age of three, they put me in a Head Start school. Um, from there, uh, all the kids that I went to school with were just like me. Uh, they were all from Hispanic families, um, and they all mostly spoke Spanish, as well as the, uh, the teachers there who were in charge of us. So it was a great experience for me. Um, they would also take a portion of the class to teach us um, English and to make sure we knew how to speak proficiently. Once I went to elementary school is when I started to see a big difference between me and the other kids. Um, growing up, I always knew I was a little bit more different, mostly because I wasn't like everyone else in the room. Going into honor programs and high achieving classes, I was the only one who looked like me. And so, growing up, I assimilated into the dominant culture. Um, I know that a portion of me during that time was ashamed of my Spanish, mostly because all the other kids around me spoke English. And so, to fit in, as most kids want to do, you do what you have to do to fit in, to have friends. And so, growing up, um, I wouldn't really speak Spanish, only if I was at home. And so anytime I would go out and be in English, I would speak in English, try my best. Then going into middle school, I was put in an ELI, even though my English was fluent. Um, I was in that for about three years until I decided finally to test out of it. Um, I think what was the courage for me was growing up speaking Spanish, a lot of my family members did have accents, but when I would speak, people would tell me, oh, you don't have an accent. Like, amazing, fantastic. <laughs> and during that time, I, I thought it was a huge compliment when I was little. But now, growing up and like exploring more of my culture, I see like, now I don't see it that much of a compliment. I'm like, what do you mean? I can speak English well enough. Um, and so, from that moment on, I decided to get more into my roots, more of my culture. Um, I'm a baby, I'm five, so all my sisters and brothers had the opportunity to explore their Hispanic culture, live and enjoy the food. But for me, I was mostly here in the United States, so I didn't get that opportunity. So the first time I went to Mexico was something completely amazing. Um, getting to see family members that I haven't seen in about 14 years was an amazing experience. But the thing is that even though I was in my home country, I was still different from everyone else. My cousins would be like, oh, it is Guera, you're white. And I was like, no, I'm Mexican, even though I was born here. But they still see me different because I've lived in the United States. And for me, speaking Spanish was a little bit more difficult because I didn't know how to pre pronounce a few words. So it was a really big learning experience for me. Um, 
Then I went on to high school, which is where I decided to learn more about Spanish. Um, I joined a Spanish class in hopes to learn a little bit more about my culture and how to pronunciate to learn that academic Spanish. Um, I think oh, another thing is that uh, when you go to county, if you take all four classes, you get a cord. And I had not taken any Spanish classes during that point. So I talked to the dean and I was like, hey, I already speak Spanish. Can I just go to Spanish four? And they're like, yeah, sure. Worst decision of my life. I did not know how to <laughs> conjugate verbs or anything, just went straight on into it, but I did it. I got the cord. That's what matters. <laughs> and so, um, Another big thing is, uh, for me, I really wasn't planning on going to college. Most because being a first-gen student, I really didn't think college was an opportunity for me, um, since my parents didn't go to college either. And so I took a gap year, and I started working. And then that's when I met a professor here who helped me sign up for college. And then ever since that day, I have not looked back. And now, look at me. <laughs> heritage but don't know how to speak Spanish and so they come to the club in hopes to learn it and it's an amazing opportunity seeing them now being able to speak Spanish not fluently they're getting there that's what matters but it's, ama it's an amazing experience and I would say also as my job as a translator one of the things that I say once I'm translating to people is that I want you to speak in the language of your heart whatever you feel the most comfortable in whatever you want to talk to and I just need to see someone who I translate for, or right over here. I always love that you always speak in Spanish and that you are not afraid to say what you have to say. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's an amazing experience. And for me, knowing the power that language has is something that I will never take for granted. Um, me and myself, I always make sure that all my nephews, nieces, they know how to speak both languages because that is a superpower, as Professor Alegria said. And she has also been someone else who has deeply impacted my love for Spanish and why I want to make sure that in future generations you should not feel ashamed for your language, for your native language, or for your second language, or maybe even your third. Because language is power. And a big study that they said is that the more languages you, you know, the more flexible your mind is. So for the people that say, this is America, you speak English, you're wrong, you're wrong. Language has no boundaries. You can communicate in any way that you want to, if that's by gestures, facial expressions, by speaking in Spanish, English, Italian. It's a big superpower. And so that's currently my experiences with being bilingual. Thank you. Um, my name is Melissa Ramos. Um, I love about me. I live here in Pueblo. I my family is primarily here from here in Pueblo. Um, because of my father's job at the time we were when I was younger we moved to the East Coast. And I'll start off by saying that was the first time I experienced the, the racial discrimination. So then we ended up moving back here to Pueblo, and that was about my third grade, fourth grade year, and stood here. But that whole time my family was here to come visit all these different things. Um, my great grandmother spoke Spanish fluently. All her children, my great aunts and uncles, spoke Spanish fluently, as well as my grandmother. Well, that my grandmother's generation decided, because of the discrimination, because of protecting us, that they didn't want us to learn Spanish. So my mother's generation was the first, and my father on both sides, two different families, same dynamic happened. Um, they decided to not teach most of those children Spanish, but of course they naturally kind of knew it. They, they heard it, they've been around it, they knew it. So 
they wouldn't speak it directly to us, but they spoke to each other at times. And then, so like my siblings and my older cousins, younger cousins, we got completely skipped out, we got cut out of it. So if we spoke first, like they understood what was going on, or tried to say something, we usually got stopped instantly, like no, don't, don't do Spanish. So for, for me personally, and what I've come to learn, siblings, the relatives of mine, um, same trauma point happened for them, where it was like, oh no, we can't speak Spanish now, or oh no, what, like why can't we do this, and not ever really getting a full picture as to why we couldn't when we were that little, um, just sort of like that. So then, when middle school came, um, we had, you know, Spanish electives, and we were expected to take that. Well, I was in a community out in the West where it was something that was encouraged to do, but I was one of the very few Mexicans out there. And so there was this pure, like, discrimination here, picking on, you know, us that were Mexican out there. So I boycotted it. I'll just finally say, I was like, nope. I'm not speaking Spanish. If I'm gonna go home and get in trouble for this, why would I do it in school? So it went all the way up until high school, where in high school I also was like, sorry, I'm not I'm not enrolling in any Spanish classes. Ended up not taking Spanish. <clears throat> and now in hindsight, regret it because I wish I would have learned, even in, in the school system's way of learning Spanish, I wish I would have. Um, to rewind, like when my grandmother would speak to us, um, they were Japanese, I just knew what she was saying somehow, so I would speak back to her in English. Um, so then as I got older, I, I literally had this like need for my culture, this, it was in my blood, right? It was in my DNA, both the, the Mexican and the native was just in me. So. I had my own inner desire to just learn my culture. And there would be times where I would try to be like, oh, I speak Spanish, and like, have a little dialect, you know? <laughs> and it's like, yeah, my elders had it, and they knew, but I was kind of putting on a front, you know, but it was kind of what we did, because we wanted to be part of our culture, me and speaking of me and my sisters, I should say. And um, so, you know, I was, always in the Pueblo community because our family lived in Pueblo. We went to all the festivals. We went to any dance. Um, my parents would go to all the, the shows, like even like the, the New Mexico type of shows and tex mex you know, different things like that. And my grandparents and my, and my great uncles, they all were in bands. They all had guitars. They all had all the instruments. They had their own band. And every, all the music that they listened to was always Spanish. Anytime they sang, it was always in Spanish. So like, here I am dancing, it was always in Spanish, like Spanish music. It was always that culture, but yet we weren't allowed to speak it. So as I got older, um, it was literally like seventh grade year. I had seen at a festival a Puerto Rico dance group performing. And in particular, it was at a cruise. And at the time, I didn't know that, but it was the Meta Cruz, and I seen them, and just knew, like, I just knew that was that was me. That was what I wanted to do. That was I want to be up there. And I turned to my great grandma who was in there, and my grandma who was still alive at the time, and I, I told her, Grandma, I want to dance. And she's okay, Mina. And I'm like, I want to dance. And she's okay, Mina. And that was that was the extent of it. So over and over again, over the years, I kept asking, I want to go dance, I want to do what those girls were doing. And it never happened. So when I turned 19, I had, had my daughter, um, I decided, this is it, I, I, I want to dance. I happened to start dating somebody that was in the dance community, um, took me to my first dance group. Then all of a sudden, I felt like I had purpose. For the first time, I felt like, I was part of my culture. For the first time, I was part of the Mexican culture. Um, but I did not speak Spanish. 
And so we would try to do the same pre-pose, and I would say I'm really funny, and some kids, you know, would say, like, you don't speak Spanish, like, obviously, like, yeah, you know, you know, you know, and it was strong, genetic, and I didn't want to say anything, so I just, I, you adapt it, you know, you just adapt to what's going on around you. And um, before you knew it, I just kept going, kept going. Um, I met a wonderful woman who many of you may know. She is the director here of the CSUP Alejo Rico, and also has a group called Mawari. Her name is Isca Marino. I happened to meet her during that time. She was the first person in our community. She was the first person in our community and first of all um, in my life to accept me for how I was and to encourage me to keep dancing, keep trying to speak Melissa. She used to play me like Melissa. Sometimes even when I introduce us about Melissa Ramos. <laughs> within just the signage and the accessibility that we have on campus, being able to market things in Spanish, giving options on our website that translate things to Spanish, also being able to make assignments in different parts of our curriculum accessible. I think that that is a really, really important thing to 
make things accessible. I also think that having outreach to the, to the schools is important, getting kids to be a part of our university, allowing people to have the resources to pursue higher education with all of these different forms of accessibility. I think that those are really important things to kind of get the ball rolling for us. There's a lot of internal things that we can do like that. I absolutely agree with that. I'm sorry, I don't remember. <laughs> um, but I absolutely agree with you. And I would also add, you know, um, promoting uh, holidays and celebrating holidays that are not just the Spanish culture or the Mexican culture, but all cultures in general, and promoting an inclusivity and a diversity in our university, um, you know, with, with all cultures, with foods that are found in the cafeteria, just in general, promoting more cultural inclusivity for, for everybody that's coming in, whether they've lived here or they don't, just creating that um, cultural inclusive, inclusive environment. Um, one of the big things that I have to say about this, I 100% agree with Paloma, um, but in addition to this, making sure that if we are translating these documents, signage, making sure that it's uh, in a way that everyone can understand. Uh, I know for my family, they, are, they don't know academic Spanish. They know the Spanish that we use at home. And so making sure that they're able to understand it is another big thing that we also need to talk about. Well, thank you ladies. That was some great information and very emotional. I got over here. Um, but what would you say we need to do to get more accessibility, not just at the campus or institution level, but in other organizations, such as like the DMV. I help people sometimes with their licenses if they're undocumented because, yeah, there's people that speak Spanish at the DMV, but when it comes to the process themselves, they're just like, go online and figure it out. There's no one there actually explaining things to them. So what do you guys think we could do to help in other places? Um, that's a good question, and it's a really big topic to tackle in general. Um, I think I've, I've also had some experience with that also. Um, and I think just making it where it's not, I think maybe it's just a cultural thing or a big thing in general, just including, you know, not just have information online, whether that be, you know, um, I know at the hospital, from my experience, we have, you know, computer interpreters who are able to get on with their language and have somebody actually physically that the people can see, that they can see that they're responding to them, they're talking directly to them, and we're able to have a conversation. And maybe including more of those interpreter type um, computer style where people are actually talking to a person of just trying to navigate something online would be helpful. Um, I, I'm not sure, but I know that that works well for us in our capacity, and I'm wondering if it would be beneficial in other capacities also. Ladies, it was really inspirational to hear one of your stories because I, I went back in time. You know, I'm much older than you guys, but I saw myself in each one of your stories, so thank you for sharing. You know, but in thinking about language enrichment, I think that, you know, if we were to target children early on in education, where whatever country they come from, whatever, you know, us Latinos, uh, if they were to enrich education and catch them right where they're at and enrich their Spanish, you know, academically, so that when they grow up, they don't just speak English, but they speak Spanish academically. I think that would be a great turn. Okay, um, <laughs> I'm not like this, but so I keep a 
chains have to be in our system, yeah, because we are here and we are too many immigrants. I always just think that language our heart, yeah, but they not translation sometimes in the paperwork and the capacity of people really. I work in the health system and it's very hard. Sometimes people give uh, papers for people to sign, to read and everything. They don't know what the, the language or how the capacity to read that these people have. So sometimes they call in and one of the things I'm not going to say is that ESL class and everything is in English. So come somebody that not speak the language, English language, go and understand it that. A lot of times when people say, oh, we are do these things and we are save lives and things like that. When you don't have another language involved in your teams, when you don't have and yeah, I'm not talking only about Spanish, yeah? Because I think a lot of times I like, want Spanish is one color. But I'm talking about people coming from other countries with other language. They, they are not have the capacity or they coming with the trauma to come into this country and not be able to reach a doctor, to reach somebody to call if they want to learn we don't have to begin in the other language. And actually, one of the big things people make a mistake, United States English is not the official language. If you like to know that, it's a wonderful thing. It's not the official language. So we have to have the capacity in our system to be able to respond to the needs and the human beings. I love to see you guys here. I think it's a lot of hope. I'm equally four or five years in this country. I know learning English in the school because I was not my English. I never dreamed to come to the United States because it was not my goal. The life and God bring me here, brought me here, yeah, I'm here. I love the country. I have two children, I have my husband. We was 24 years married yesterday, anniversary. I'm proud of who they, they are. But yes, as a Mexican, really, really, I feel a lot of the stuff because yes, I'm Mexican. I'm so proud to see what the young generation bring to us. I'm really I'm proud to meet you guys. Thank you. Going back to integrating the CSU with the community, um, have you guys ever thought about creating a program where uh, students will volunteer to do this kind of uh, services and get into credits for the community? For example, like, you know, she mentioned the, she mentioned the DMV. So let's say let's create a, a program where, you know, students for CSU who are different languages, linguistics, you know, different languages, could help people in the community on that matter, create like a committee for the CSU to integrate with the community and let people know that CSU Pueblo is also bringing those services to the community and they bring more students for their port to the school as well because they support the community and the community supporting the CSU Pueblo. since I was a freshman here, and I, ever since I learned it was a HSI, Hispanic Extreme Institute, the, uh, in the beginning I didn't see any, and I know my professors from the social department can attest to this, I was very adamant about this, and so uh, I spoke with the then former president, uh, Timothy Wote, and we have been able to get different services for Hispanic serving uh, individuals here. One of the biggest ones that I help with every year is interpretation for the graduation. For those who are monolinguistic and who speak Spanish, I do the interpretation for them so they can understand what's happening. Because I know what it's like to not be able to understand what someone's saying. 
and see their smiles on their faces when they hear their child's names pronounced correctly, first of all, and then hearing the degree that they're getting is something that they always tell us afterwards. They're like, thank you, like it was an amazing services. In addition to this, um, some professors here, uh, I think last year, uh, the people that helped me get certified, we brought them here to the university to help certify other students. From there, those students have been able to go out to the community and help in addition with also interpreting for other monolinguistic Hispanic speakers as well as some other languages. Um, I know for me, for my year in presidency, that's something that I do want to take charge of um, and create more initiatives. Um, for the people who want to speak Spanish, I want to create a group for them where they can practice their Spanish without fear of being judged if they're pronouncing it correctly or not. It's just a place for them, a safe space where they can practice and not feel judged. So those are some of the initiatives that I would like to start for a season. Um, thank you. Spanish in uh, middle school, high school, but also here at CSU Pueblo. Um, how do those experiences compare to each other, and what would you change, uh, especially at the middle school, high school level, um, as far as language learning? So you were in a room full of supporters, people that 
want you to succeed. People that, um, you know, in decades past have fought for the things that you are benefiting from now. So my question is, if you were in a room full of people that do not want you to speak Spanish, they do not believe that your history is important, your culture is important, and they they want you, you know, to forget all of that. They want you. They want to take you back generations. What would you say to that crowd? No me importa si tú me quieres aquí, yo voy a hablar español. so much. I'm wondering, outside of the Spanish classes and the language classes you've spoken, um, how maybe supportive have you felt or what are strategies or things that maybe professors or instructors have used in their classes, um, whether for you or for your, your peers that have maybe made it felt like a welcoming environment to be multilingual? In general, just having support is one of the biggest things. Because having someone who believes in you when at times you don't is a big thing. Um, in addition to that, I know that for our Spanish classes, uh, here at CSU Pueblo, we have a World Language Center, where if you're having difficulties uh, understanding any of the homework uh, or just need help, they are there to, to be able to provide those resources. In addition, they also have tutors um, who can help you with one-on-one. -on -one. So I would say also having that one-on-one -on -one contact, having someone focused on you, focused on helping you in areas that you're struggling is another big thing that we have here. Yes. Um, in the education department, I think that they do a really, really good job of trying to get us to see the need of inclusiveness and understanding that we have a really big role in shaping academic journeys for students. So being able to have strategies and knowing the resources to be able to advocate for students that are second language speakers is something that they really, really try to have us understand. And I think that that is something, the exposure, understanding that you can make a difference even if you don't speak the language, that 
you have people that you can reach out to, programs that you can use on campus. I think that that is a very, very important thing. And I know for a lot of classrooms here in Pueblo, you know, you're seeing a 70% Mexican demographic at a lot of these schools. So being able to expose kids to what their culture is, how they can be proud of who they are, how one person can make the biggest difference, how every time that we sign our names on assignments, every single time that we turn in something with your name on it, you are representing your ancestors, all the fight, all of the people that want you to succeed. So I think that just being able to understand the impact that you have as an educator, as an advocate, that that really makes a difference for a lot of the kids that we see in our community. Okay, I think we'll cut it there. It's time for us to take a quick break, but I just wanted to say it seems like, thank you so much, Lady, for sharing your stories and your personal experiences. Um, we It seems like we've had, we may have Got a lot of work done. There's still lots to do, and I'm hopeful that you are going to help us get that work done. Um, so one last round of applause for our panel. On our break, um, we have uh, something for you to do. So I have two.